So, uh, all right, so I want to talk a little bit today, sorry for the delay, about um, just some of the philosophy uh, behind the sound design and what led to certain decisions in creating um, some of the, we you know, the weapons in Doom. And uh, I will, if we have time, I want to show a little bit of the voice processing for Samuel, who's one of the main characters in Doom. He's a big robot. He talks to you. And I, had a lot of, I heard a lot of people come up and a ask me about the processing of that voice. Um, so I figured I might show that. So real quick, a um, little bit about me. So I was the senior sound designer on, on Doom. Uh, I am now the audio director because our, our audio director went to Bethesda and uh, recommended me to be in charge. That's his mistake. And uh, so now I'm doing that. And I've been in games for like 16 years. And I suppose I should get yeah, some check the time. Um, worked on a lot of titles, EverQuest, EverQuest 2, Planetside, Star Wars Galaxies, Matrix Online, DC Universe, Doom, a bunch of other stuff that when I started you probably haven't even heard of, so it's not worth mentioning. Uh, I studied music composition at Kent State University, received a master's degree in film from San Diego State, and uh, do my own experimental electronic music on the side. And I also collaborate with uh, my friend Mark America, who's a really cool artist, a visual artist, and we do a lot of projects together. We're just starting a new project, actually. So, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so when I got when I came on to the Doom project, uh, we were about two years away from ship. And uh, we looked at the what we call the pillars of Doom, things that were going to be integral to the new the new game. And so one of the first things everybody was talking about was they wanted to bring back all of the things that made the original Doom awesome. And so let's do that and let's bring that back. But how can we bring that back and put it into a modern, you know, into modern games? So the other thing that id likes to do, which is what attracts me to id, is they're definitely the anarchists in the game industry. If everybody's going this way, they're like, you know what, let's go this way and do something uh, totally different. So uh, I really love that. So whatever everybody else in shooters is doing like tactical combat, cover mechanics, you know, kind of sneaking around or like run and kill demons. That's what we're going to do in Doom. There's no hiding. We're going to incentivize you as the player. Like get out there. The more you kill, the more health, the more ammo you get. Um, you know, the monsters in Doom are really like uh, pinatas. You, you blow them up and health comes out. It's pretty cool. Uh, so that's what we were trying to do. Uh, Get everybody moving forward, and that's that's the that's the term that came up in meetings was push forward combat. So these are all things that we're thinking about that are going to um, inform the audio design. Uh, so we knew we would also have uh, three 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 uh, areas modes of the game: the single player campaign, multiplayer mode, and then the world level builder called Snap Maps, which presented a lot of issues uh, for us um, because they had to be consistent over all three modes and they all had to load into memory and loading into memory for single player and multiplayer wasn't a big deal because we knew what we were dealing with with the snap map stuff the player has access to absolutely everything so they're like oh well everything has to be loaded so we ran into a lot of uh, problems with loading every single sound and making it available for, for players to build levels but we have great engineers who helped us fix that so um, so yeah, I just worked that stuff. And then we wanted to mix it like a heavy metal album. We were like, Doom has to sound like a heavy metal album. So music and guns and monsters are like uh, 11 the whole time. So we said, what is Doom really about? We have all these things, but let's get it down to what is the key component for Doom? Well, it's big eff effing guns. Like that's <laughs> the, the main thing that Doom is about, and a chainsaw. So um, <laughs> we took that to heart and we said, all right, nothing trumps guns. Guns are king. Your character, he's a silent protagonist. He, uh, he's just this angry guy. He, doesn't, he never speaks. His voice is really his gun. So that's what we said, weapons above everything else. Main character in Doom is your gun, silent protagonist, the weapon becomes his voice. And, and it's even illustrated in the very first scene of the game. You get up off this table 
you immediately shoot demons. And we were like really excited about this. We're like, look, it's a game that doesn't have a 15 minute movie intro. It's <laughs> you immediately are shooting stuff. So uh, you get up, you do this, you go through this little doorway, you find your armor, you put your armor on, and immediately there's a screen and Samuel starts talking to you. But what's great is he's like, so this is what you have to do in the game, blah, blah, blah. And your character just goes, <laughs> smashes the screen and moves on. He's like, I don't give a shit about what you're telling me. I just want to shoot stuff. So, so anyhow, Doom had to deliver that ultimate power fantasy. You are this big, badass killing demons. Um, again, it's kind of redundant. but and So we achieved that through the glory kill sounds and the weapon sounds. Uh, Another issue we ran into was we were like, since guns are king, they can never be ducked by anything, even VO. Well, designers hated that because designers were like, oh, we can't hear our VO in this section because of the guns. And we're like, well, move your VO. <laughs> why, are you putting, why are you putting VO where there's going to be combat? That doesn't make any sense. So we had like a lot of conversations about desi with design about pacing. And they would say, well, we need to put this here because we want to stop the player before they go into this area, but then there's a chance that some demons will come down. We're like, okay, well, there's a chance you're not going to hear your VO then because we're not going to do it. Um, <laughs> and we won, ultimately. We just stuck to our guns, and we won. <laughs> so, they <laughs> so they moved stuff around for us. Very nice of us. Um, and that's just what I just told you. Uh, yeah, so we have... Uh, Regular guns and power weapons. And power weapons like the BFG, which everybody knows. Um, the new one called the Gauss Cannon, which is just not as powerful as the BFG, but, but pretty cool. And then the Chainsaw, which is instant kill. And then the Chainsaw gives you the added bonus of even more health. If you chainsaw an enemy, it's like double pinata. So, so that was pretty cool. So that's the Gauss Cannon. And I got a little video so you can see it. Hopefully you can hear it um, in game. So let's see if we have sound. So you can kind of get a hear what it sounds like in game. Oops, why did I do that? Um, so, right. So there now each power weapon, except for the uh, BFG, had uh, mods, so you could modify them. So like when you saw me zoom in, that's actually a sniper mod. So uh, and then there's one called uh, Siege Mode. And um, where you would like dig in and you could like, basically if you hit an enemy, it would just go through the enemy and kill anything behind it also. Like, so if you had four enemies in a line, it would obliterate all four. Uh, so we had to design sound for not only the, the, the cannon itself, but then for the mods and make them sound slightly different. And, and that was challenging also. So we wanted fast, punchy, big sound. Uh, lots of distortion. That was another thing. We like embraced distortion on Doom. We're like, oh, it's not distorted enough. Like, let's really distort it. And um, some of the wave files, like, I would probably be embarrassed to show because they're just, <laughs> just terrible. Not the way you should design sound. Uh, but it works for our game. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my process as a sound designer getting this weapon. So. Uh, I, I know I met some of you are already in games and how many are students and learning? Uh, okay, so this is this will be valuable. Uh, so you get a weapon, you know, designers like, hey, here's a new weapon. Um, and your audio director says, here you go, go to town. So uh, where I always start is capturing the vi capturing video in game, going through playing it. And then I start as a personally as a sound designer, I start thinking of what are all the elements that I can imagine in this weapon? You know, what's going to make it do what I want it to do? So I like to just gather source. So I'll 
go into, I, I like to go into Bigel and use uh, Reactor. And one of the nice things we had, Reactor and Zebra, one of the nice things we had on Doom was that the weapons aren't realistic. We didn't have to like go buy, we didn't have to go do a, a, a weapons shoot and get realistic sounding weapons because that's not what we were doing. We were making distorted noise when you fire weapons. So I could totally be synthetic and mix with some metallic punch elements and things like that that we did record or grab from a library. So initially I'd start in Bigel uh, because I, I like Bigel because I can do a lot of real time just gestural stuff uh, and record it as I go and it just spits out a big long file for me to take into Pro Tools and chop up and manipulate as I want. Um, so I'd go in there and then I'll go into Kima a lot of times. Uh, I'm a big fan of Kima. I just really like it. Kima lets you take a very small amount of source and turn it into a very large amount of source very quickly. Um, so if I have like just a little bit of uh, electric sound that I need for a weapon, uh, I'll take that into Kima and granula granulate it and stretch it out and pitch it and again spit out this big long recording of gestural granulated stuff that just turned that little bit of source into like 10 minutes of source. And then I'll take that source back in the Pro Tools, edit it, find the find the space for it. That sounds like a long like Well, I mean, you can get lots of sounds. Yeah, I could definitely get that. I can get short, quick. Um, it's hard to explain Kima if, if you haven't worked in it, but it, it lets you do things very quickly. And as a sound designer, in a game, that's key. You want to do things very quickly. So I, what's great about Kima is that it will build um, sort of prototypes for you, like all these uh, sort of sets with different effects arrays. And you can kind of go through them and preview them and then customize them, randomize them, customize them to your to your liking. And then you end up with usually pretty cool source. Oh, Symbolic Sound is the company. Uh, small company, great, amazing people like Every time I call, I get Carla on the phone, and she's like one of the, the geniuses behind it, and she's just an amazing, wonderful person. So anyhow, she's helped me tons. Exactly, right? <laughs> and you're like, oh my god, you're such a, you're a genius. So, so I'm a big fan of Kima. I love supporting that company. And um, so yeah, so you can get lots of great things out of that, and then take that into Pro Tools. Uh, also, yeah, library manipulation and Pro Tools. So let's see if I can get the session to work. If it finally loaded, and I can show you like what it looks like. I like that. I know it's missing something. Skip. Okay. First, let's see if it plays. It doesn't. Why doesn't it play? It's so weird. It's like not connecting. No, yeah, it, it should be. I'm just gonna like kick this off. It's gonna get mad at me. Let's see if it reconnects. There we go. So weird. Um, I was gonna suggest possibly, I don't know anything about Pro Tools, but it looks like there's like a little sound thing at the top there where all that blue, like with the blue highlight stuff. What's that one right next to it? Oh, the, uh, these are actually tools for editing in the timeline. Oh, okay, because there's, the there's like a, just yeah. like to see where you actually push the mute button or something. All right. Well, I'm gonna quit this, relaunch it, and we'll talk about some other things. I apologize. I've got, I got, I have other things I can show you. Um, all right, we'll move on here. After I do all the sound design in Pro Tools that I just showed you, um, I take all that material into Wise. And if you guys are all familiar with Wise, it's a audio engine go between basically. Um, let's do a lot of really cool, cool things as a sound designer and 
not being a programmer, it lets me do lots of things that I that I can't do because I'm not a programmer. So, oh, that loaded a lot faster. I think it's going to play this time. No, it's not. That's so weird. All right, well, I can kind of show you this stuff, but you can't hear it, unfortunately. So these are the layers of the Gauss cannon. Uh, man, I really want this to work. It was just working, too. Is there, like, output settings? Will you guys be uh, upset if I restart? Uh, we can, oh. you guys can, you guys can, can we can talk about stuff? You can ask me questions. We we're going to do that at the end, but we'll just do it now. I'm going to ask the very general question: What made you want to get into sound design and games? Well, I loved video games. I was going to I was going to school for music, and well, I started I so I started my career as an English major because I love writing. I still love writing, but I and I. I started way back doing music on my Commodore 64, which is ridiculous. So, and I was doing stuff there. And then I got a guitar and I got into weird stuff. Like I got into Skinny Puppy. That was like my first big electronic band. I was like, this is cool. And like, it was hilarious. Cause you guys may not, some, some of you will remember this, some of you will not, but there used to be tape clubs and you would get cassette tapes in the mail, right? And so I was part of this thing and I got, an REM tape once and I was like oh whatever REM is fine and my cousin Tessa who's super cool she calls me and she's like hey I got this band you might like it they're called skinny puppy I was like yeah bring it up she brings it up I put it in I'm immediately like this is amazing I want I want this and she's like do you want to trade something I was like she's like how about REM I was like it's yours take it I was like hey it's a great trade um, so uh, that, got, that kind of launched me into electronic music. And then from there, I got, got into like King Crimson and then Brian Eno from King Crimson. And then from Brian Eno, I discovered John Cage. And once I discovered John Cage, I was like, oh my God, everything makes sense. This is really cool. Uh, and then I got into like Leggetti and all that weird, just weird academic elect electronic orchestral stuff. Um, and now, I, I mean, I listen to like, I listen to everything, lots of soundtracks, lots of uh, electronic music, a lot of rock, a lot of weird goth stuff still. I don't know, whatever. But so long story short, yeah, I uh, was really into games and computers and electronic music. And I was going to school for music composition. And well, I started as an English major, switched to uh, photojournalism. because I was like, well, I was having problems with early American literature. I didn't like it. and. Uh, and my advisor was like, well, if you don't like early American literature, you shouldn't be an English major. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I changed to photojournalism because I liked photography, but I loved music. And so I was like doing a music minor. And uh, I was just like, I got to find something to do that with this. And I was playing a lot of video games. So I had one class left to finish my undergraduate degree. And I got this opportunity to go into games. Like there was a game job posting in Boulder, Colorado for startup sound, like startup for an entry level sound designer. I applied, I got an email back from um, Heather, Heather Sowards, who was the audio director at the time, good friend of mine now. And she sent me this email and she was like, oh, I'm glad you're interested in the sound design position. Just please send a sound effects demo. Don't send us any of your music, any of your music. We don't care about that. We have a composer. I was like, okay. and. Um, I was like, well, what's a sound effects demo? Because I hadn't done it before. And uh, I did a lot of research. I went to uh, gamasutra.com and I found an article this guy wrote about how do you make a sound effects demo, which wouldn't apply nowadays. But back then, like 16 years ago or whatever, it did. And um, I just made this soundscape that was like a five minute, almost like a music concrete piece, like, which was kind of like what I was doing anyhow with my music. And um, I sent it off. and. I got an email saying they wanted to do a phone interview. I did a phone interview. And then um, I passed that, flew out to Colorado, uh, did an in-person interview. 
and had to take an audio test, and I had to know what the Nyquist theorem was, which I did, fortunately. And uh, I got the job. Well, years later, Heather told me, she said, you know that when you got the job, your first job in games, she said, I had a box of demos that this big. And she's like, I'd been going through them for like a week, two weeks. And she's like, I was having a really shitty day. <laughs> and she's like, your demo was at the bottom of this pile of demos. And she said, I, my day was so bad, I dumped the box out. And, and she's like, then yours was on top. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, and you put yours on a bright red CD. So it grabbed my attention and I grabbed it and put it in. And she's like, and I was like, finally, one that doesn't suck. And so I went right into the call pile and I was at the bottom of the box. So a little bit of luck there. Thank goodness she had a shitty day. And, uh, and so that's how I got called in and that's how I got the job. So a little bit of, I hope, skill, a little bit of luck and a little bit of research, you know, to get in. Um, that was a long answer because I was doing this, but um, we still don't have sound. Unbelievable. Why is that? I wonder if it's going to the wrong help thing. It's so big. I wonder if I've got. Uh, I probably could actually, but I wonder if I could go. Uh, if anything's coming through the headphone port, probably not. <laughs> well, funny thing is, that's how I made them all. Well, don't worry because I can show you guys so, the Samuel process. That? Where do you see that? The red, it's on, see over it says tracks, and it's on that list, and there's one that's in red. Uh, left, all the way to the left. Yeah. Oh. The red text. Yeah, I don't, I don't, shouldn't it be. Oh, it's master. Master shouldn't be muted. What does that mean? I would be really embarrassed if the master was muted. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Maybe there's something weird going on there. What's that? You just keep talking about the scope of stuff for a second. You sure. Your, your, did, you, did you court on your manager a second ago? I saw it. Where was it? You see it? Uh, I saw it on your. Uh... No, let's hide this. You guys should have been in my room 10 minutes ago. <laughs> doing this. Yeah, I'm sure it was working fine up there, but I can close this down. Okay. Okay, quit your console, is that okay? Exactly. It's so true, and then the opposite at work happens. You'll be like having a, a problem, and you'll be like, call IT, like this is not working. And they come down and you're like, well, it's working. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And the IT's like, why are you wasting my time? It's like taking a car to the mechanic, right? Um, exactly. Uh, but if we can't get this to work, don't worry, because I can show you the sand. I hopefully Ableton Live will work, and I can show you the sand. Because what's weird is slideshow is playing, so it's just something in Pro Tools that I probably screwed up when I moved stuff. Um, um, it works primarily on uh, weapons sound. Did, did you, how much of a save did you get in music? Uh, you know, the music, the composer was selected before I came on, uh, Mick Gordon. and But yeah, and he just killed it. Richard worked with, with Mick. Yeah, you. Richard's amazing. He delivered amazing stuff to me. Uh, but so yeah, we. Uh, that was already selected, but we would. Uh, Chris, who was the audio director uh, on Doom, he would call me and Ben into the office whenever we get a new track uh, or a group of stems, and he'd be like, "What do you think of this?" and it was a good, there was a lot of back and forth uh, kind of getting to the sound, um, you know, with Nick. And it was hard because everything he delivered was awesome. Yeah. It's just that, well, we want to go more in this direction. And then you've got creative director telling you other things too. So it's not just an audio decision. It should, you think it should be, but it, it really isn't. Um, so, you know, that like, that was already selected. Now, uh, now that I'm the audio director, on new projects, I will get to select, <laughs> well, in collaboration with Marty and Hugo, who are executive producers and creative directors, um, 
what direction we go in. So this is bizarre, right? Yeah, it's not even seen. I don't get it. Do you have any other apps, sound apps that are active? Uh, well, I, just I suspect that one of those has taken over, and so even if you watch Pro Tools, it's yeah, there isn't because I restarted. Yeah. Pro Tools is the only thing running. But let me see if uh, I'm going to see if uh, Ableton will work. I'll get your emails. I'll send you each a video later that, that works. <laughs> um, but really, all I was going to show you, I was just going to show you how I layer my stuff in Pro Tools, which you can all do. You can all do. All right, let's see if this works. Oh, really? That doesn't make any sense. The terminal. Ah. And I'll give you what you need. Thank you. <laughs> I'm blocking your access to the facility scanner. Okay. We'll get to this then. That totally works. Yeah. Hooray. Um, so now you guys can't get your money back. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Like, so that was about music. Last question. Um, so you guys had it teamed up with Bethesda for this new gym, right? We did not team up. No, uh, Bethesda's a uh, sister company. They're under the Xenomax umbrella. Okay. So Xenomax owns Bethesda, id, uh, Machine Games, uh, a couple other things but no um they didn't bethesda didn't work on it they published it probably it right. probably published under bethesda xenomax that's Do they have any say on the whole development of doom or was it all it? it's primarily it obviously we have to take things to the corporate gods and say this is what we're doing and they say great or yeah we want to do this or this uh, but this is pretty flexible it's a really cool company they really give you a lot of creative freedom and in the audio department, we have a lot of creative freedom. Like nobody came and said, your guns need to sound like this. Yeah. They just said, here are the guns and we designed them. It is very rare that you design guns and nobody complains, but nobody complained. Like even Chris was like, I can't believe it. Like they like the, the everybody likes the guns. I mean, but we did, a, we really focused a lot on the weapons. Like I said, for yeah. obvious reasons. And to that point, I feel like the creature design suffered a little bit. Like this, the creature design's okay, but whatever our next project is, I plan on focusing more on creature design because I want to do it and I feel like we nailed the guns. So let's make really cool creatures next time. Creature sound design? Or creature, creature sound design, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the creature design, I mean, the actual design, I mean, we don't have much say. Yeah. Uh, we do have meetings, you know, when we talk about things and I send you know as an audio person we go to every meeting even if we're not involved in audio or even if it's not about audio just so we can see what's coming and get some ideas yeah. uh, lots of what were your favorite weapons or the most difficult to design okay so favorite weapon was the grenade launcher which got cut because one of the producers hated it because we would have play tests and I, I'm, I'm not a precision web, precision player, I suck. And so I would use the grenade launcher all the time and we would play these objective-based matches in multiplayer. Well, this one producer, he was just kind of a jerk, but I would like, <laughs> I would be getting tons of kills. I would be getting tons of kills and he'd be like, it's that grenade launcher, it's not, it's not balanced, it's not a good weapon. I'm like, dude, you just suck. And I'm just good with it. And so he got it cut. And I was really, really angry. But there's a... I, I can't say what we're doing for DLC stuff, but we might get a grenade launcher back. So, um, which would be really awesome. So I love the grenade launcher. The hardest to design was probably uh, the, vor the Vortex rifle, which was actually the, my first task when I came on came on to id 
one of the issues was when I first came on, there was a mix up on my gear. So I didn't have gear for like three, three to four weeks. And they were like, they're very strict about, you can't bring outside stuff into the company. And I was like, Chris, what do I do? And Chris was like, I bring your stuff in. I was like, I'm not allowed to. He's like, yeah, I know, but just bring your stuff in. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so I brought my stuff into the studio and worked um, on the Vortex. And it was like, it was really stressful because it was like two weeks before QuakeCon that I started. So they were like, get the Vortex rifle made. Oh, and here's this video with the Revenant and uh, we need the Revenant to be like super creepy. And, ah! and I was like, okay, I do a lot of stuff without any equipment or just with my personal equipment. So it was really, it was really tricky. Um, and then the Vortex rifle, I'm, one thing I'm sad about is that I had this plan because it's a sort of like a rail gun from Quake. It's like super powerful, super precise weapon that I don't use. And I wanted to make it um, so that whenever you fired it, it would actually affect the audio of any players around you. It would like distort them. And we just didn't have time. We didn't get to do it. It's not that hard to do in Wise, but it just, it got, it's one of those things that we were gonna do and then it just fell off the wayside and didn't happen. So uh, that's a, a thing I'm disappointed that didn't happen. Um, okay, how much time do we have? Can we go over because of the problems? Yes. All right, sweet. All right. Let me get back to where we were. Um, this thing's kind. Of, this this is kind of just a dumb road roadmap for me. It's kind of stupid. Um, let's see if Wise works. I can show you. Uh, I can kind of show you how the Gauss is laid out in Wise. It's very simple. Uh, another thing about coming onto the project. So I hadn't actually used Wise. I had used FMOD, and Chris was kind of new to Wise, and so was Ben. So we were all learning Wise on the job, and um, we, you know, and so that we could have done a lot of really cool things, more cool things, and we didn't. So next next project is going to be better for that even. So when I show you the Wise stuff, you know, any of you that's familiar with Wise are going to be like, oh my God, what were they doing? And then um, it's, very, it's pretty basic. It's pretty basic implementation. You know, we did use RTPCs, which are real-time parameter controls, but we use them not as much as we should have. And next time we'll do, we'll do better. Let me find my uh, wise file. <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell. I, I have no idea what that is, but I'm sure there's one somewhere. So. I'm sure there's a gun in it somewhere. <laughs> Might be a puzzle game. Yeah, it's probably a puzzle game. <laughs> you guys, uh, you guys played Candy Crush? I think it's called. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Doom Go. Like, oh my god. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, like a lot of broken phones, right? Like, yeah. shit. <laughs> Something's so weird because none of this stuff ever takes this long to load. It has to be because I moved it all. Um, what other questions do you guys have? Sure. Um, no, but we uh, look for distance. So anything that's outside of a distance, they're prioritized. So things that are closer have high priority. Um, and we actually had an issue with, we do this thing called virtualization of voices in WISE. So what's supposed to happen is if something is outside of the, the receiver's range, it just gets virtualized. It's still playing, but it's not cat. It's not in memory, so to speak, active memory. Um, and you, so it shouldn't take up a voice. Well, we had um, an issue tw like towards the very end of the project where we realized that virtualization wasn't working properly. And um, like we had hundreds and hundreds of like torches in certain levels. They were all playing <laughs> and they were all taking up a voice. And we were getting like huge CPU hits and it was really freaking us out. 
we finally figured out what it was and we're like, okay. And we had to get an engineer uh, to fix it. We also did not have an audio programmer for like three quarters of the project. The final end, we got uh, audio support, um, which helped a lot. And now we've recently just hired a full-time audio programmer who's coming from Europe early next year. So that'll be great to have him on board. And he knows WISE really well. So he's gonna fix our implementation. Also, we went from, so id Tech 6 had its own sort of proprietary sound engine and Chris <clears throat> thought to get WISE installed so they ripped out the proprietary stuff and put WISE in but it's kind of poorly implemented because it was like thrown together by our engineers and our engineers are great they just have other things they have to do uh, so we're hoping to optimize that integration of WISE and utilize it a lot better uh, it was a it was a it was an engine bug, so yeah. What what it wasn't a bug with Wise. It was it was with how our engine was interacting oh. with it. Yeah, it wasn't Wise. So the other thing we did is total amateur thing because we hadn't used Wise that much. Was we found out the crossfading in Wise is amazing. So you can make like if you want to make a set of loops of fire, you can just render a ten second wave, load it into Wise, chop it up in Wise, and then tell it to crossfade. You know, with equal power and it sounds great and shuffle it and pitch it well we were doing that everywhere <laughs> and then the engineers are like oh my god this is really expensive i'm like oh is it sorry <laughs> sounds great so um we uh decide we then we had to we made a pass and we're like what's not important these torches are not important <laughs> so we uh ripped all that out and just made single fire sounds so if you're gonna go hang out by a torch, man, you're not gonna be impressed, so. Uh, all right, let's see if this is playing. Oh, look at that. So, this is the Gauss rifle session in Wise. The actual fire is right here. Can you guys all see that? It was kind of small. I can't, I don't think it's in. Um, we used uh, switch containers. So if you guys are familiar, and WISE gives you this thing called switch containers. So we use those to uh, differentiate between first person and third person assets. So um, especially in multiplayer, all first person assets would be in stereo on the player. When you're firing your gun, you hear this really cool stuff. Third person is kind of a stripped down, you know, uh, positional version of that. So we use switch container for that. And then we also use a switch container for um, gun reverbs. Now this is a problem that everybody solves. Reverbs in rooms, in games, aren't always that interesting. They're not that good. Um, you wanna, they can be expensive. Um, so what we did was we pre-baked reverbs for different spaces. Um, and then we mixed those in and we would tag the spaces in the game. So I would go through the level, I'd be like, oh, I'm in uh, a big cavernous area, so I'll use the large cavernous reverb for the gun. So whenever I fire that gun, I get the gun sound plus that pre-baked reverb that you hear with the tail. Um, now, third person does not get that. They just get the room verb, but it doesn't matter really because it, it, you can't really tell. Um, so went through and made all these reverbs. Um, this is like the hell reverb, which I wanted it to be like kind of weird. Um, and these just get mixed under the small room. The uh, let's see, tight room, kind of cool ring, tight metallic, and then their front rear, their quads. Um, so yep, exactly. So I'll show you um, in the actual fire sound here. I can go to my uh, switches. <laughs> that is not me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. All right, so there's the full fire. And that's with the external large reverb. If I change it to the hell reverb, I don't know if you can hear it in here, but there's a subtle. Can you turn it up? Can you crank it a little bit? Yeah. Uh, let's see, and here's the. Uh, 
the pipe. If you're, there's some, there's only like a few spaces where you're in these tight pipes, but you get that different reverb. Just those reverbs, yeah. Like the actual fire, the actual fire sound is in its own uh, thing here. So that there's the reverb switch, and then the fire is here, and then the reverbs are up here. They get put into the same event, and then the trigger, or I mean the switch, looks for what environment's been tagged, and it plays the appropriate uh, reverb. Um, so that's how we handled it. There's a lot of ways to do it, and I, there are better ways to do it. But again, we weren't going for realism. Uh, we were not making a, a battlefield. Uh, we just wanted to enhance the experience a little bit and um, make it kind of surreal. And it's doomed, you know. We didn't. We didn't care. <laughs> no, I mean we cared, but we didn't care what other people were doing. Um, now. This is the, uh, so this is where you build your audio events. And then you would actually go to the trigger events and I would find the Gauss rifle in here. SP Gauss cannon. And this is where the actual events that get triggered by the game live. And there's lots of different elements for the Gauss. This is lots, but here's the actual fire. And you can see it's playing um, the weapon Gauss fire sound, which has all those things in it with, with the switch containers. But then it has all these stop events. This is an interesting, this was a big problem on Doom. So when the engine was uh, built, like I said, it was taken. So in Tech 6, it was ripped, the, their audio stuff was ripped out, which had these different ways to stop sounds. Well, now we wanted to start using Ys to stop sounds. And we ran into an issue with game object IDs, where game object IDs weren't stored properly in memory. So we, if I had three rockets flying, I couldn't stop just one of them because they all were referenced by the same ID. So anytime I wanted to stop something, it had to be, it was supposed to be a global stop sound. Now these are game object stop sounds. That's actually wrong. <laughs> that shouldn't work. Um, and it was a problem that we brought up over and over and over again, and they just didn't have time to fix it. So, for instance, I had a level where I had these two, no, sorry, there were four like shuttle things. They were like spacecrafts that would go up, and then the other one would come up, and they were on two sides of this big arena, and the player had to like mantle up and ride them up. Well, every time they thrusted, I wanted to do a thrust and then a loop and change these triggers. I had to make, I couldn't just make one set of sounds because I couldn't kill them individually. I had to make eight different sets and name them separately so that I could globally stop thrust 4B and it wouldn't kill everything else. Um, that was a big pain, a real big pain actually. So, but we're gonna have that fixed for future stuff, thank goodness. Um, so, let's see. Let me show you guys. That's a little bit about the guns. Is there any more qu questions about the guns? I, uh, sorry that the presentation's a little scattered. Go ahead. Um, when you're uh, designing the, uh, the sounds for guns or creatures or anything, is, is there some sort of uh, method that you, you're meant to follow? Or is it literally just the case that you look at it and you say, what would sound good with this? Or like, what, what do I like that goes or matches with this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's... It's not necessarily what would I like, it's it's more what is appropriate. Um, and I'll, I'll look at it and I'll look at how it's being used. Think about the philosophy that we talked about um, and the pillars of the game, you know, and look for the right feeling. You know, you want it to feel right. But it's that, that's, that's a hard question. There's, there's no rule, really. It's you just do it and until you get it to where everybody's like, yeah, that's the gut. Yeah, so in multiplayer, it's a different system. We didn't have to do stop by, well, we still had to do stops, but for the weapons and the character sounds, they 
I don't know, it was some kind of programming magic. The programmers did it and it worked. So honestly, when the game launched, it was like hanging on a thread. <laughs> We're like, oh, don't touch it, it works. Um, so yeah, it, it was programming. But what, what ideally it shouldn't, it shouldn't have been. It should have been wise. I should be able to tell Rocket 1 to stop and it stops, but Rocket 2 and 3 still play. So, I meant like, I was gonna ask that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before, but uh, I actually meant like the, for the, uh, the sound of the, from the kind of frequency mic, I think. Like, how you stop is like, there's so many different types of guns that people bring to play. Oh, like, right. I see what you're saying. Right, gotcha. Well, I mean, we limit. We, have, we can set limits on wise. So we can say how many of one thing can be playing at once. Um, and it, it actually didn't become an issue because so many people use so many different weapons. You might only get two or three people using the rocket launcher, and they're not necessarily firing them at the same time. And because it's positional, it just didn't it didn't really become a problem. Um, yeah. Did you use different sounds for like when guns were far away? Yep, we did. Uh, and and actually, those like so those those gun reverbs, like I said, they're not on the third person versions. Those are just mono. And you don't get all the me mechanics from the third person, you just hear the impulse of the fire. And then we um, just let the room reverb handle the distance stuff. And we attenuate it. So we use our PCs to attenuate by distance. Um, it's very basic. So, but yeah, that's nothing too fancy on that. Can you go ahead and explain the different layers you use in the offline? Yeah, I mean, I can. can show you but I can't play it um, I mean I'll, I'll just give you my the way I usually approach a gun is in frequencies I'll have the base frequency the mid frequency and the high end and usually the high end is like the mechanics of the gun um, base is the impulse and then the mid is sort of the distortion area um, one trick I use it's a great trick if you want to make your gun sound bigger is start your impulse but then stop it and put a gap and then start your impulse again. And it's like, and it like sounds extra big, even though it's not. Um, I use that all the time. I use that on the gals. So I just have that little gap. So it like sets you up and then drops you and kicks it in again. Um, but yeah, really just EQing. And then one thing, and this maybe I answer your question too. When we, um, when we EQ'd the final game, cause like, we didn't do any mixing till the end. We like put everything in. We kind of earballed volumes on things. We had like, okay, guns are going to be here, voices are going to be here. You know, we set those things. But then we went in, and we would just run around, and we put EQs in Wise on each thing, and we'd connect to Wise, and then we would mix. Like, okay, we're going to mix the rocket launcher today, and we would run around and fire the rocket launcher at each other and look at the frequencies, and then we would EQ based on other things happening in the game and mix. And what's great about Wise is you don't have, that doesn't have to be rendered in real time in the game. So once you get it where you want it, you just click the render button. Then when you kick out your banks, it does it like a doll would and it builds that wave and then it never loads that effect in the game. So at runtime, you don't, you're not taking that CPU hit for those effects. It's just, it's pre-rendered. So you're able to basically do compression, and EQing all in Wise without, you know, a lot of overhead because you can just render it. So it's a really great tool. We did all in-game mixing and it. Uh, that was re a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, let me show you uh, Samuel. Oh, I actually want to show you this too. Um, this is just kind of a fun thing. Um, that gives you a little insight in, into game design. So we have test levels, right? And you never get to see these test levels. Well, this is a really cool And uh, see like all the pickups in the game and access all the guns and fire them with our monsters and test them. So this is something you wouldn't, wouldn't normally see. And like, here's my gals. And then over here's my gals.
being able to do that. And then we had all sorts of cheats and codes that we could that you need to, to build a game and test. Yeah. So would you say that this was your favorite sound design project, or if it wasn't, what was? Oh no, this one for sure. I mean, it's horror and sci-fi. As a sound designer, there's nothing else that you'd want to do, really. That's the best. <laughs> so, you know, although I really want to do a romantic comedy. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, cool, if we have time, I'll show you Samuel. Yeah, I'll let you go until uh, 10 after. What time is it? Okay, great, okay. So, I want to show you uh, Samuel in game. And then I'll show you the, the session. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I have supplies in my office. This way, please. Take whatever supplies you need. on a large stone artifact we pulled from hell in the earliest days of the program. We call it the Helix Stone. It is our most closely guarded asset. So that's the introduction to Samuel, and then I actually have this one. It's a gift. strength help you on your journey if you can withstand the power surge So a big thing when <clears throat> doing a, a robot or any voice is actually selecting a good voice actor to begin with. So if you got a good voice, then the processing will really stick and you can really do nice things. So um, this is the actor's dry voice. I'm blocking your access to the facility scanner. Come to the Vega terminal and I'll give you what you need. And he's got a nice quality to his delivery and his It's a gift. Take it. It will give you strength if you can withstand the power surge. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me, but I know who you are. This was all a terrible accident. Okay, so now here's the processing. Uh, I knew you were going to ask me his name. I forget. <laughs> I have to go look in the credits. It might be Darren DePaul, yeah. Or he's really good. I think that's him. I, uh, it's just, I haven't looked at it in a while. So, um, But here's the processing. Well, then I'll go through what's involved in each layer. So uh, ignore the last dry one. It's really the three layers together. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me, but I know who you are. This was all a terrible accident. So I knew that I wanted him to sound metallic because he's a robot, but I didn't want to go overly metallic. And I wanted him to sound bigger than human because he's really a human that's been put into a robot. So we really had to watch intelligibility. Like you had to be able to understand what he's saying, but he still had to sound cool and big like a robot. So in the first layer, I have some metallic effects, um, the GRM resonator, which is really good at making that, and then um, some reverbs using a guitar rig and a chorus. And then I've got uh, a little EQ with this Pultec and uh, a final compressor. 
and uh, and then a gate because I was getting a lot of weird noise because of the compressor and stuff. So let's put the gate on to get rid of that. So this first layer is really a dry voice with the metallic. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me. Now the next layer is the crazy shit, the distortion that is underneath everything that if it was on its own would be a mess, but it works really well in the mix. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me. But I know who you are. So this, you know, pitch down. And uh, I, this plugin I use like religiously, the Evolution, GRM Evolution. I don't know. I, I love it. I use it all the time for pitching and smoothing things out. Like a lot of times I'll distort something and then use this to smooth out the distortion. And you get these really nice textures in it. Um, but they don't sound, they don't sound like distortion, but they do. I can't explain it. It's really good. Uh, that one? I don't know. Let's see. I mean, a little bit. <laughs> and then um, this, this, this layer has really got the pitching in it, so. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me, but I know who you are. Now you can do different combinations. Check out uh, those two together. I'm Dr. Samuel. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You so that's pretty cool, but then when you add that third distortion layer. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me, but I know who you are. I'm blocking your access to the facility scanner. Come to the Vega terminal and I'll give you what you need. So, other thing I'll show you really quick is sort of the process of developing that because you don't get it right away. So like version one, you know, you're working with different art and stuff and, and you're trying to come up with ideas and it's just like this version sucked. I don't know. I'm blocking your access to the facility scanner. Right? That's terrible. And then um, version two. I think I added like the, some pitching. It's kind of the same thing, but with pitching. I'm blocking your access to the facility scanner. Come to the Vega terminal and I'll give you what you need. So I think that one was getting closer. Uh, and then in version three, I think I tried something completely different. Cause you never know, you're like, oh, I don't like it. But then you come back to it and you're like, oh, I like it. Um, after you try a few things. So here's another version. Oops. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me. What's cool about this one, though, is I like the first layer by itself. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this Mars facility. You don't know me. I know you are. This is a terrible accident. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean... That, that, yeah, totally. That, that could have been our Samuel, but uh, I'm actually glad I ended up where I did. I think it's a good mix of human and robot and a little bit of distortion. So, uh, so this is funny. I did it. I, so for the English, <laughs> I did it all in Ableton and hand did each one, each file. For the, for the Loke, I was like, eh, I'll come up with a batch. And I made a batch that's not that good. And it's OK. Uh, but it approximates it. And that way, I could batch everything. But yeah, because I had three layers, I couldn't. You know, you can do like freeze, flatten, and then you get the file, but not in multiple. You can't mix and do that, at least not that I know of. So yeah, um, the English, if you play the English, sounds way better than, um, than the load. OK. Well, sorry for all the technical issues. I'll be glad to talk to anybody afterwards, um, but I gotta quit. <laughs> I gotta stop the presentation. So.